Fabulous Night series. My name is Sarah Johnson. I work part-time for the Wilderness Workshop and collectively with the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, the Wilderness Workshop ourselves, and the Roaring Fork Audubon Yay. Society. <laughs> we host this series and have hosted this series for a number of years. Um, it's an awesome opportunity to bring experts from afar to the community so that we can all learn a few things. And um, this year, I've been so grateful to get to help coordinate some of these speakers, um, but for years I've always come. Um, so it's been a neat opportunity. So these talks are hosted here every Wednesday at 5.30 and then up in Aspen at ACES at um, 7 o'clock on Thursdays. And if for some reason you can't make it or the weather is bad and you don't want to get out, you can always find these pr um, productions actually on Grassroots TV. And they air them on the TV station, but we also post them to our organization's websites. So if you miss something, you can always come find it later. Um, we do have generous, generous sponsors who m help make this happen. Um, tonight's featured sponsor is Land and Shelter, which is right here in Carbondale. And they have helped to make the filming of these programs possible. And also all of these other sponsors, some of you are in the room. Um, thank you, thank you. And d make sure you, if you know any of these organizations or businesses, to tell them thank you when you, when you um, go to visit them. So tonight, um, I will be passing around a uh, clipboard in a moment. It's important to us to know how many people have come to these talks because our donors really appreciate knowing. So please, if you haven't already signed the clipboard, I'm going to pass that around and just um, give us your, your name, please. And next week, as I said, we do these weekly. We um, will be ha happy to host a man named David Leatherman, who is actually an entomologist, which entomologists study what? insects, but his talk is all about birds. So it's all about what birds eat. And I've always said that if you get to know your friends, you know your friends by what they eat and where they hang out, you can get to know birds the same way. So come back next week to learn where they eat and where they hang out. But tonight we're um, fortunate to have from the, uh, south of here over in Gunnison, uh, Pat McGee drove all the way through the blizzard this afternoon um, to come over. He's from the Department of the Biology biology department where he is the director of the Thornton biology research program at Western State College or Western State Colorado University. Um, he's lived in Gunnison for quite a while and he actually went to school back in Missouri where I'm from which is kind of fun um, at the University of Missouri and he got his m master's and his PhD there in wildlife biology and then he returned to Colorado to work for CPW or Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, as the coordinator of the wetlands program before joining the faculty at Western. And at Western, he teaches a variety of courses, including diversity of life, ornithology, mammalogy, ecology, wildlife ecology, and management, and Colorado ecoregions class. Um, and he has a great passion for teaching students outdoors and bringing the outdoors and science alive to these students. Um, so we're, he's also been working on some collaborative efforts uh, to conserve the Gunnison sage grouse, and I know that he'd be happy to maybe answer some questions about that after, you know, later this evening. Um, and so we will have about a 45-minute presentation and then time for questions after that. So, and when we do questions, it's important that we use this microphone, even though you can't hear it any louder. So I will get some more chairs out, and I'm going to pass it off to Pat. So thanks for being here, Pat. All right, thank you, Sarah. Appreciate the invitation here. And um, I also wanted to thank Larry and Kay for giving me a place to stay <laughs> while I'm up here. So thank you. And thanks everybody for coming out. Really appreciate it. This was a hat my niece made for me. And uh, unfortunately, it's a little too big. So I'll just show it for a second. It was kind of nice. OK. So. Um, uh, I'm going to try to cover several topics associated with the um, red fox tonight. When I was talking to Sarah, we were talking about a whole wide range of possible topics to talk about, and uh, so I narrowed it down to only a, a whole book's worth of <laughs> content. But, so anyway, these are some of the things that we'll address and try to talk about. Um, 
This was a photo taken by my brother-in-law in Gunnison, and um, I just wanted to, first of all, introduce the red fox. The red fox is an animal that is found uh, very widespread across the world. It's, found, it's uh, one of the most widespread animals uh, with its native distribution of, of all wildlife on the planet. And so a lot of different people from a lot of different countries know about the red fox. They're familiar with the red fox, and they've become a very familiar species to many of us here in the Southern Rockies as well. Um, a lot of people really love the red fox, and a lot of people don't love the red fox so much. Uh, they can, uh, they're, they're, they're legendary animal in terms of uh, children's literature, and they have a, a reputation that is sometimes not so pleasant, but other times it is. To, to be able to identify the red fox, there's about 43 different subspecies of red fox all over the, um, all over the planet, and there's about 12 in North America. Um, so they come in a lot of different um, color uh, morphs and so on. Um, but you can always tell a red fox if it's this animal that has these black tips on its ears. They tend to have these black legs. And the one characteristic that's the most important that you can always tell a red fox, no matter if it's a black red fox or a cross red fox or whatever color it is, they always have a white tip on their tail. And gray foxes do not have a white tip on their tail. So those are the main fox you might uh, confuse with a red fox. So anyway, this animal uh, covers a lot of area all over the planet. Um, interestingly, they're somewhat of a newcomer to certain parts of the Southern Rockies. And we'll tell more of this story later. But uh, where did this animal come from? Uh, what, what is its origin? Why is it here? What, what kind of lifestyle does it lead? How does it make it in these places of the Southern Rockies, especially in the winter? So that's what we'll focus the beginning of this talk on. And before we jump into that, I'd just like to encourage you and invite you, I guess, to open your hearts and your, your minds to uh, letting this animal inhabit you. Uh, let, let your senses be the senses of the red fox. Let your body be the body of the red fox. Let it uh, uh, become one with you so that you can really understand how it is making its living out there on the landscape. Put yourself in its shoes, put yourself in its fur, uh, so to speak. So anyway, the red fox is an animal that uh, lives here year round. And much of the time, the biggest uh, struggle that it has probably is uh, surviving these winters. And Jim Halfpenny, who's a relatively well-known mammologist and animal tracker, winter ecologist, he uh, defines winter as uh, the screw factor, right? So you can see this poor fox out there, he's just getting screwed by the winter. Um, <laughs> but what, what the screw factor means is that uh, the S is for snow. Right? So what is this winter environment? And when we think about what is this winter environment, we're, we're talking about how does this winter environment serve as the selective forces of evolution that's shaping the adaptations and the strategy of red foxes to be able to live in those kinds of environments. So one of these things is snow. Um, winter is a snowy time of year. Although uh, some of you, uh, how many people here are local? Okay. So most people are local, but some of you are from other places, maybe not so wintry types of environments. And uh, you can still have winter, but you may not have as much snow. But uh, the winter purists talk about a threshold uh, that you don't have real winter until you have about 20 centimeters, a little less than a foot of snow accumulation on the ground. And that's, that's persistent, right, through most of the winter. And the reason that we have that threshold of about 20 centimeters is that that's enough snow to create a, a gradient of temperature from, the, from above the snow down to the ground. And the ground with the radiative uh, the radiation seeping out of the ground is creating this warmer environment at the surface and creating this process called deconstructive metamorphosis to the snowpack, which many people around here are very familiar with as a dangerous thing. It creates the depth hoar. It's this hollow, crystally layer at the surface of the snow. Very dangerous. It uh, unfortunately claims a lot of lives uh, every winter here in the Southern Rockies. A very scary thing. But to many wildlife species, this is the opportunity uh, for a life in the winter. It's called the pukak by natives. It's the same thing as the depth or it's this hollow crystally layer underneath the snow that allows many 
mammals, small mammals especially, to be able to live within the snowpack, living under the snow in an environment that's much, much, much more, uh, um, you know, a, a, an easier place to live than up on the surface, being exposed to the wind and the sky and all those kinds of things. So the snow is a very important piece of how we define winter and one of the selective pressures that acts on the red fox. Um, also cold. So of course this is an easy one to associate with winter, but uh, cold temperatures, the coldest temperature ever recorded in uh, Colorado is about 61 degrees below Fahrenheit, below zero in Maybell, Colorado, northwestern Colorado. Similar temperature in Taylor Park down by where I live in Gunnison. But uh, anyway, that's pretty dang cold. And uh, the, the important issue for winter and for this being a selective pressure on an animal, we call this thing, uh, and, and we're the same as this, but it's called an endothermic homeotherm. In other words, a, a warm-blooded mammal. And so they, they generate heat from within their body through this metabolic activity. And they try to maintain the temperature inside their body the same, pretty much you know, day and night winter, summer, and so on. So this is a big challenge. When, the, when their temperature is about 100 degrees inside their body, and it gets down to 60 below zero, you have a 160 degree temperature differential between the body and outside. Now that's an extreme, but in Gunnison, over the last uh, several weeks, we've had uh, routine temperatures down below 20, 20 below zero at night. And, uh, and certainly being zero degrees is not uncommon in many places for winter habitat. So you have a hundred degree temperature variation between the body and outside. And the steeper the gradient between temperature from the body to outside, the quicker that heat wants to move out, right? So this is a huge challenge. How do I maintain the heat inside the body to be a warm blooded homeothermic animal? Very challenging situation. Um, and then the R in the screw factor is the radiation. What happens in winter, of course, is that we have shorter days and longer nights. The shorter days and longer nights mean that there's less incoming shortwave solar radiation and a lot more outgoing longwave radiation, especially at that night sky. You just see this radiation just pouring out of the earth, right, into, the, into, the, uh, into space. We're losing all of that radiative heat load. And what's really important about this is that when you look at the balance between the incoming radiation and the outgoing radiation, a way to define winter is that we are existing in a net energy, uh, um, it's a net negative energy balance, right? So there's more energy leaving than coming in. You can't sustain life very long in that kind of situation, right? So another extreme challenge uh, to be an animal that lives in the winter. And then energy kind of associated with radiation, but going another step further, you have this net negative energy balance, you have this cold temperature, you have the snow, the snow is covering a lot of the food, you have much, much, much reduced food availability at this time. Many of the food sources are either covered by snow or birds, for example, have migrated hundreds, maybe thousands of miles south. Many insects have died during this time. The plants are senescent. So there's just much less food available. There's much less fuel to, for the furnace of this warm-blooded mammal. And so with all of these challenges, then you have less fuel available to, to make up for the, those challenges. So, Energy uh, and the limitation, the scarcity of food is another really important characteristic that defines winter. And then, of course, wind. I was driving in this today and I told a couple of people I was coming down um, from uh, north on 133, I think it is. And uh, I hit, it was beautiful. The, the road was dry, the visibility was great. And I hit the county line, Garfield County line, and <laughs> There was no visibility. The wind was howling. It was like a blizzard. And uh, that's what happens in winter. The, the mean uh, wind speeds are usually 20 to 30 degrees higher in winter than they are in summer. And the importance of wind is that it creates convective heat loss. And we, we can uh, understand this best by the, the idea of the wind chill factor. So it's zero degrees Fahrenheit out, but the wind chill is 20 below. And what that means is it feels like it is actually 20 degrees below zero, and our bodies are experiencing that environment as if it was 20 below zero because of the heat loss that's happening, 
because of the convection. It's causing that heat to pour out of our bodies at a much more rapid rate. So this is another very important factor that influences the ability of uh, animals to survive the winter. And so as we sum this up, we have this hymal threshold, that snow cover uh, across the landscape. We have the net negative energy balance and then food scarcity. These are not a great set of conditions <laughs> to try to survive under. So how do mammals and red fox particularly deal with this? So this is the uh, decision tree. Um, when we look at this selective force of nature, how it's working on animals, what do they do? How do they address this? Well, some just don't at all. These are what we refer to as kyanophobes. A kyan is the Greek word for snow. And so something like an armadillo here just isn't in the presence of winter. It doesn't exist in the presence of winter very much at all. Um, so they just don't have any adaptations really to deal with the screw factor. Other animals are present and they may or may not have specializations to deal with those winter screw factors. Uh, here's a decision tree here. You can either avoid the screw factor or you can tolerate the screw factor. And so those who avoid do uh, some pretty um, substantial things like die, you know, to avoid it. And again, insects usually have like an annual cycle and many of them are dead during the winter. So that, that's how they deal with it. But then their eggs hatch out in the spring or whatever, and then they uh, continue on their annual cycles. Many birds, of course, are migratory and they just leave the area uh, before the conditions get too bad. Um, those that tolerate are things that we call kyanophiles, so snow lovers, snow lovers, winter lovers. And you can either tolerate in an inactive form or an active form. The inactive form of toleration of being a snow, a winter lover, being really well adapted for winter, uh, has to do with this strategy of hibernation. And we have this guy here in a den, this bear, that is hibernating. But what we find out is that bears don't really hibernate. And my students get really mad at me when I tell this because it's like injustice. <laughs> They're like, yeah, my whole life, People have told me that bears hibernate. You can't be telling me that bears don't hibernate. Well, they don't really hibernate. The difference is that they do this winter lethargy. And winter lethargy is a shallow form of torpor. Hibernation is a deep form of torpor. It means that if you're a hibernating animal, you drop your body temperature down to almost zero. You, you might, your heart might beat once every minute or more. You take a breath once every six minutes. A very, very low state of metabolic activity. The challenge of being a hibernator is that you have to wake up, you have to arouse out of that hibernation maybe once every three weeks or four weeks during the winter. And during that arousal, you have to raise your body temperature all the way back up to normal. So from zero degrees C up to about 39 degrees C. And for small mammals, they can have enough fat stores to be able to do that several times and still survive. For a big animal like this, the amount of fat it would have to store is just impossible for it to be able to do a deep torpor or real hibernation. So they are not hibernators, they're winter uh, lethargists, I guess. So the last thing we have here is these active animals. They're active throughout winter, and they're trying to figure out how to deal with all these different uh, snowy, cold, uh, low radiation environments. So one strategy is, as we were mentioning earlier, is to go below the surface of the snow. This is called the subnivian environment. And so many small mammals take refuge sort of under this snow, but they're active year round, uh, during, all winter long. They're feeding, they sometimes come to the surface, and they're not exposed to that wind, that deep convective heat loss. They're not exposed to the night sky, that radiative heat loss. So it's a pretty comfortable environment compared to uh, above the surface. But here in our foxy red color, we see that some animals stay above the snow in the supernivian environment, and they just take on winter full on, the full on strength of winter. And the red fox is among these organisms. One of the interesting things is that no matter who you are in this stage, one of the key features of dealing with winter is that you have to insulate yourself from winter. If you're small, you don't have a large enough body size to grow enough hair to cover your body in an effective uh, thickness and amount of insulation. It would be too heavy, it would be too burdensome, and so on. So they can't use fur to survive that way. So what they can use is snow. 
and go underneath the snow. On the other hand, if you're a larger animal, like a red fox or larger, you can't go under the snow, you're too big. But you do have a large enough body size to be able to grow hair, enough hair that you can use hair as an insulator for. So it's kind of, there's allowances and restrictions on the kinds of adaptations that uh, animals have to uh, deal with winter. So anyway, what does the red fox do? Well, it has, uh, these are the challenges again, and it has two, a two-pronged strategy. One is this insulation strategy, and one is a metabolic strategy. Basically, what their, their challenge is is to balance the amount of energy coming in with the amount of energy going out, the heat coming in with the heat going out. So this one is really how do we decrease the amount of heat loss, and this one is how do we increase the amount of energy coming in, balance that equation. Um, this is mostly about morphology, about the, the structure of the animal, about their anatomy, and it's mostly about this dense winter coat. One of the... Uh, one of the winter ecologists calls this the private climate of the animal, right? So they adjust their private climate. Um, and they do this by having a molt so they can change from summer into winter. And this other strategy is we're mostly going to focus on this piece. It's a behavioral way of bringing in more energy, mostly through food, so foraging. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then there's this other component of here that's physiological. And we'll just brush through that a little bit. So here's, the, here's a, a graph, and I hope graphs don't scare you guys, but this is a, uh, amb the ambient temperature, the environmental temperature, right? Going from colder to warmer. This is the metabolic activity of the animal. So this is how much calories are they burning, right? And so from low calories to higher calories. And what this is showing us is that there's a zone of environmental temperatures where animals, where mammals and foxes can maintain their body temperature without having to do any kind of increase in their, uh, their burning of calories, any kind of metabolic increase in activity. Um, right at this tipping point here, it goes from using physical characteristics to maintain their body temperature to using physiological, metabolic activities. So this means, at this point, life gets expensive and life gets more challenging. You have to fuel that engine. The only way to fuel the engine is with food, right? Um, so this is, this is the breaking point. And that's called the lower critical temperature. And so at the lower critical temperature, you shift from just using physical properties to physiological properties. The red fox can adjust its lower critical temperature by 40 degrees Fahrenheit from summer to winter. So what this means is in the summer, when it's 46 degrees outside, the red fox has to start doing some sort of physiological metabolic activity to stay, to maintain its body temperature around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? At 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and the main way they do this is through shivering, shivering thermogenesis, the production of heat through shivering. But shivering costs energy, and so they have to feed the engine to be able to do that. Um, in winter, look, they can get down to 8 degrees Fahrenheit before they have to spend a single uh, amount of energy to, to um, uh, fuel the body. And when you get farther north into animals like the Arctic fox, they can do this even much better, down to less than minus 40 degrees C, which I don't off the top of my head know the, what that is in Fahrenheit, but anyway, minus 40 degrees C. Um, so anyway, um, how is this done? How is this shift in lower critical temperature done? It's again through this hair. Mammals have hair. That's what defines mammals. And it's important. It's very important. And that, that, that's all it really takes to make this massive adjustment in the lower critical temperature. And so this is for a river otter, but you can see that there's the fur, the pelage is made up of an under fur and then these outer hairs. These are the guard hairs, they're called, and this is called the underfur. And this is a microscopic view, so you can see the guard hairs and the underfur. You can actually, if you find a hair, uh, part of a pelt or just some hairs laying around, you can actually look at them under the microscope and identify the animal because these scale patterns are unique for each species. Um, but anyway, this dense, dense fur is the key to that insulation strategy. And when we look at what this means, look, the underfur of a red fox 
uh, is about one and a half inches thick during the winter around the neck. And then the guard hairs are up to three inches thick. The importance of the guard hairs are, are they protect the under fur. Look at this. This is a graph that shows the fur thickness in relationship to the insulative value of the fur. So here's the red fox, right? And there's a nice relationship. The thicker the fur, the more insulative value. It makes sense. Look at this. Aren't we not supposed to wear cotton in the winter? Why is that way up here? It's like the best. So cotton's okay unless it gets wet, wet of course. And so then it's worthless. And so a red fox will be fine unless its under fur gets wet. So it has these guard hairs, this outer fur to protect the under hair. And that's why this is longer and uh, uh, protects all that under fur. Look, there's 3,600 hairs per square centimeter on a red fox. That sounds pretty good. But when you look at a sea otter, which is the record holder, and I didn't uh, compute this into the same units, I think it's about, it's over 500,000 hairs per square centimeter on a, on a sea otter. But those, these guys are in the water all the time, and it's always cold water. And so it makes sense that they have a much thicker, denser underfur. The problem is with these guys and with a lot of these guys, it's like us. So I see most of you have come in here and you've taken your coats off. Right? A red fox goes outside, <laughs> it can't take its coat off. And it goes into a den and it can't take its coat off. And it's a sunny day and it can't take its coat off. It's stuck. All these wild animals that are living in the winter are stuck with their coat on. And what's really fascinating about this is that, you know, I always thought about this a lot earlier in my life that I would be driving down the highway and you see this deer out there and it's 20 below zero and you go, oh, that poor deer. How can it make it out there, right? Well, deer are good at this. They have thick, thick fur and they're very well insulated. And I don't think they get that cold at night, right? Um, the bigger challenge for a deer and a fox and other animals that are well adapted to winter with this insulation, with this big coat, is that they experience heat stress. For example, mule deer, when it's 25 degrees below zero and it's sunny and they're on a snowy landscape, they can go into heat stress, right? So what do they do? They have to go into the shady cover and sit down and not move around. And, you know, they, it, it's a challenge. And we all know it when, when we don't take our coat off and we go inside and it gets really warm and then you start suffering, right? And then dehydration and you need water and all these kinds of things. So anyway, the red fox does pretty good. They're up here just right near the caribou, which is one of the best insulated mammals, and the arctic fox right there. So they do just fine with that winter coat. Um, and this just shows you, this is a wolf actually, but it shows you, this is a thermal imaging camera. The blue is where there's no heat escaping the animal. The yellow, there's more heat escaping. Look, it's around the face, the muzzle, the ears. Some of these inside linings of the legs where there's uh, not as thick fur. Um, but otherwise, look how effective this coat is. This animal's not losing any heat. This thermal imaging camera doesn't show anything escaping. It's really fun to do this with humans. And you show a picture and you're just, our whole bodies are almost red and yellow, just glowing, because we don't have that protective coating around us, right? And then there's this little thing. This is a wolf from uh, the USGS study working in uh, Yellowstone. And this is actually mange, oh. right? And so it's lost its fur there, and it's a little hole in the shelter that is allowing all this heat to escape. So, Foxes also get mange, uh, and so and you can see if this starts to um, grow and uh, be a big problem for that animal, it could easily be death for the animal just because of the thermal challenges it would face without having that dense coat. Another thing that foxes can do is change their geometry. This is a curl, right? It's a nice circle, and if you know your heat physics, right? Uh, the best thing to be is, a, is circular because there's the, you minimize the surface area relative to the volume. The volume's what's generating the heat. The surface area is the route for heat, to, for heat exchange, to lose heat, right? So the lower uh, surface area you have relative to the volume, the better situation that is. So they can tuck their head in there and that big tail. I meant to show you I have this fox 
paper. I can just pass it around, but you can uh, check it out and see how beautiful and effective that winter prime coat is of a red fox. Okay, so the second strategy is, to, uh, is this metabolic strategy. And uh, this is all about foraging, getting food, right? And like other carnivores, what red foxes do is they, they have territories. This is sort of staking out their claim on a certain amount of food that's in this landscape. And they have to protect that. And so they walk around, they spend a lot of, it's expensive to be a carnivore in terms of your activities. You have to every day go around and evaluate your territory. You have to mark your territory, make sure the boundaries are secure, see if anybody's intruded. You know, if there's anyone in there, you know, run them off and so on. So this is an expensive life, but it makes sense because then you have this food supply that's yours and you don't have to uh, compete for it as much. Another thing we know about red foxes is that, and they oftentimes get this bad reputation as just killing for the sake of killing, and they don't even need to eat these things. They're surplus killers, murderers, right? Uh, well, it's true. They do. You might have a red fox that goes out there in the winter and kills 10 rabbits in one day, and it might only eat one of them, right? So what's it doing? Well, it's caching. And it, it, we call these scatter hoarders. So in other words, they scatter these caches around their territory, and they kind of use it as a short-term storage, sort of like a refrigerator. So not a long-term food pantry, right, but a, a short-term refrigerator. And they'll go back and they'll find these rabbits and they can eat them. It's tough to be a predator. It's tough to find food, especially when it's buried three feet under the snow, right? So if you have this other source of food, when, when you do get a relative abundance of food, you can you know, collect a bunch of that and then uh, store it around the, the territory and then go back and eat it again. So this is a very important piece of the, of the foraging strategy that red foxes do, hoarder, uh, scatter hoarders. Um, and then uh, what happens when the food supply gets really scarce, they may stop hunting altogether. And because it costs a lot of energy to be walking around and looking for food and diving into the snow and all this kind of stuff, if they just sit still, they're not spending as much energy. They know that the food is so scarce, they're not likely to find it anyway. And so they can go into a period of somewhat starvation and they can last for a little while in this state, not as well as Arctic foxes, but for a little while. And then hopefully it, until the food supply uh, gets better. So that's a kind of extreme strategy, but sometimes they need to do that. And this is sort of interesting. Um, uh, there's a little video I'll show you if I can get that. This was actually from NPR, but uh, So they're using their hearing, but then there's this other new piece that's sort of a hypothesis. We don't have good evidence for it. But it takes immense concentration, and he needs complete quiet. His ears can pick up the faintest scamper from beneath the snow. <coughs> <laughs> but there's a catch. <laughs> he almost always comes up empty handed unless he's facing north. 
But how's that possible? As unbelievable as it sounds, scientists now think he's actually homing in on the magnetic field of the planet, using it to calculate and plot his trajectory. The kind of math missiles use to hit their targets. <laughs> Just the slightest distraction can throw them off. <laughs> but if he's got the North Pole in his sights, he's guaranteed a meal nearly 75% of the time. Really? <laughs> All right. So it, it's tough. To, I mean, even though they're so good at this, um, it, it's tough to be a carnivore and to hunt for a living. And, and most carnivores only are successful one out of every 10 or 20 times, right, of, of attempting. So anyway, interesting, and, and this isn't established knowledge at this point, but it's a hypothesis that maybe they're able to detect the magnetic field of the Earth and uh, triangulate that with the sound coming from the prey. And then as those things intersect, they, they're able to uh, figure out where to exactly pounce. Okay. Um, I have plenty of time. You shouldn't say stuff like that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this, uh, I'm going to kind of go through this next section fairly quickly. This is some of the research that I've been doing with my students. We're trying to understand better how these animals use the landscape. What are these territories? What are these home ranges? What do they look like? How often do they move? And so on. And so to start this, you have to trap these animals. And uh, this is a red fox in our trap. To do this, you have to get a permit from the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. You have to get a rabies vaccination. There's a lot of things that go into it. And then foxes are pretty clever, so it's not necessarily that easy to actually get them to come into a trap. They're very smart, and, and they don't like that. Once we, once we get them in the trap, then uh, this is one of my students, Preston, uh, who's now at the University of California, Davis, working on his PhD with uh, Ben Sachs, who's uh, the uh, world-renowned fox geneticist, and I'm, we're working with him on some stuff that we'll talk about here in a minute. But anyway, uh, Preston is holding this fox here. This is its head, and we just put this little sock around its um, muzzle, and each fox has a little bit different personality. Some of them are really aggressive, and you have to hold them down, and they try to bite you all the time, and then other foxes are really uh, calm, and once you have them out like this, they'll just lay there until you're done. What we do is we pour flea powder over them. Uh, they have a lot of fleas, and so we try to give them a little break from the fleas. And then we, um, we tell what sex they are, what age they are. We um, look for any injuries or any other signs like that. And then we uh, put a radio collar on them. Um, this is an example of the uh, collar that we put around their neck, right? And then, um, and then we also do something that's not so nice, but it's important as part of the uh, genetics work. We just take this like little paper punch, hole punch thing. It's a little smaller than that. And we take a punch out of their ear. And uh, then we take that little tissue sample and we send it to University of California Davis where Ben takes over and looks at the genetic stuff. So it bleeds a little bit, but we put a little alcohol swab on it and then it usually stops bleeding right away. They don't like it and I don't like doing it, but it's, uh, I think it's worth the, the information that we're getting. So anyway, when, when we get this uh, uh, collar going here, some, some of you are probably familiar with radio telemetry, but you just get your setup and you turn this thing on and then the fox is running around and it's beeping. It beeps 24 hours a day, seven days a week for as long as the collar lasts. And what's interesting about it See, we're so close to it, you're going to hear the beep everywhere. But it's a directional antenna. And so we can tell where the fox is relative to our position. And then we can do this thing called triangulation, where I'm here and I can take a compass reading on this fox from here. And I can take a coordinate with a GPS unit. And then I can go over here and do the same thing. 
And then where those two lines cross on a map, I know that's the location of the fox. And then we can plot that on a map using GIS, and uh, we can do all kinds of spatial analyses looking at um, uh, what, what these foxes are doing. So here's another one of my students, Kristen Barker. She's now at the University of Montana working on a project with wolves and elk, but she was uh, really interested in the foxes. Both these projects, which we're doing through our undergraduate research program at Western, have been really good for students being able to get into graduate school, being really prepared for that. So it's a really cool part of our program at Western. Anyway, some of the things we found is that this is what happens. This is, uh, what is that? That's <coughs> like uh, 6 a.m. and this is 6 p.m. and then here's almost 6 a.m. again. So we have this bimodal activity peak. This is some of the information we can get from radio collaring these foxes. We know that they're mostly active at night. They're active at the twilight times and they're less active during the day. Right? Um, so that's interesting. And why are foxes active at night rather than the day? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. One might be to avoid humans. One might be to avoid coyotes. Um, they might have better success hunting at night. This is a picture I took of a red fox up above Gunnison, up above Crested Butte, and it's feeding on a carcass of a deer that we actually put there because we were trying, to, we were trapping snowshoe hares at the time to do this study on snowshoe hares, and we didn't want the predators to come in and eat the snowshoe hares in the traps. So we had this as a decoy. <coughs> but anyway, they love things like this. It's carry-on, dead stuff. They're scavengers. This is a list of a lot of different things that red foxes eat. And look at the bottom. They eat trash. They eat pet food. They, they like humans a lot. Um, this is a little cabin that we like to stay at up at Gothic, Colorado. And it's so nice to be there in the wintry paradise. And then at night last year, we were up here and we'd look out the door. And this guy is right next to the door. And if we had opened the door, he probably would have walked right in the cabin. So this guy is really used to people. People are probably feeding it and it just knows that there's resources available. So they're very adaptable uh, in terms of the kinds of food they eat and sometimes the strategies they use to get that food. Here's another, this is a GIS map. Each one of these little dots here represents a point. So using the radio telemetry, this is a point where we located the fox. And then what we can do is put these together over a 24 hour period. The students love this, staying up all night looking for foxes. but. Uh, we, we put this together and they travel here and then they go over here and over here and this one ended up traveling 8.7 kilometers over the 24-hour period. This one traveled 8.5 kilometers over the 24-hour period. On average, our foxes are traveling 10 kilometers in 24 hours and that's, in the literature, that's a common amount. So they're moving about six miles a night, right? Um, the other thing that we find out with these collars is sometimes they're laying on the ground, sometimes there's other parts of foxes laying on the ground. The fox, when you heard that beep, 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 when a collar lays there for 12 hours without moving, it switches the pulse rate, and so it goes beep, 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 and you know that's a mortality signal. So as soon as we hear that, we go out and we try to find the fox to see what happens. The main thing that are happening to our foxes is they, they get, the number one cause of death is they get run over by cars. And you can see in this diagram that this is a main highway, right? And here's the fox's home range with the highway going right through the middle of it. We had one fox that crossed the main highway 12 times in one night. So the main cause of death is collision with cars. And the other main cause of death is getting shot by people. Um, so lots of uh, foxes are getting into people's chickens or their lambs or just they're hanging around. One was in the barn of a rancher and he was afraid it was gonna kill the cat, so he killed the fox. <laughs> um, and anyway, so lots of mortality. Um, foxes don't live that long uh, because of that. And then here's the last piece that we're uh, trying to study is this idea of home range. Where does the fox live, right? So each one of these circles represents a home range of a fox. You can see they're all different sizes and shapes, so not every fox has the same kind of home range. Uh, the, on average, they're about 1,200 acres in size, which is on the small side for when you look in the literature of foxes all over the world, but uh, not, not overly small. And what's interesting is they overlap. Remember we were talking about having a food supply that's your own? Uh, this is unusual. You don't see that a lot. And it might be related to being, this is the town of Gunnison underneath all of this. So these foxes are right in town. 
and there might be relatively high food supply in a place where there's human trash and all kinds of things. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, the last part of this, I wanted to help tell this story or try to tell this story. Um, I haven't really told this story before, so this is a new <laughs> attempt for me. But it's a very interesting story. And what this shows us is that red fox are, as we mentioned earlier, they're widely distributed. In fact, these are some quotes that come out of the literature. The widest distribution of any terrestrial carnivore in the world. The most widespread wild dog. Largest natural distribution of any non-human animal, mammal. So, and you can see where they are, right? Um, I think this is introduced, right? But otherwise, this is mostly their natural distribution with some, um, some expansion, natural expansion. They're all over the place. But notice one thing over here in the west, southwestern United States, there aren't very many red foxes, or at least historically there haven't been. And so we're wondering, we have red foxes all over. I was talking to some people right before the talk, and they say there's red foxes all over Carbondale. There's tons of them. They're very common. They're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. What's the deal? What? And, and so we have this blank spot on the map. But they are here now. And this is kind of new. When I talked to a lot of the old timers in Gunnison, I was talking to a guy named Earl Parch uh, the other day. And he um, graduated from high school back in like 1951. He grew up in the 1940s in Gunnison. And there were no foxes in Gunnison. And all the way, yeah, and there are now. And there weren't many foxes in the 50s. And there weren't any foxes in the 60s. And there weren't very many foxes in the 70s. They started showing up in the 80s and the 90s. So what, what's the deal? What are these foxes? Where are they coming from? And is this a good thing or a bad thing? What should we do about it? So this is showing some of the work of these fox geneticists. And what it shows is North America, right? These are foxes that are connected to Eurasia. And so it's one group of genetically distinct red foxes that has similar genes to these Eurasian foxes. These are foxes from Eastern North America that are native, and these are foxes from Western North America that are native. What happened was the foxes came over from Europe, from Eurasia, in uh, about 400,000 years ago. They came over here. And then over the next 200 or so thousand years, two or 300,000 years, they moved from up here all the way into various parts of North America. And then, what happened was about 100,000 years ago, we started getting into these cooler glacial periods. And a lot of these foxes disappeared from these areas, except this group stayed. And there were some up here in uh, northeast Canada. And then there were some down here, especially in the Rockies and the Sierras and the Cascades, in these what we call southern refugia, where it was boreal-type forest, high-elevation forest areas that were not glaciated. And these were all eliminated here. So we had this distinct genetic group, and then this group that then became isolated over about 100,000 years. So this group became different than this group. And about 12,000 years ago, when the glaciers started to recede and stuff, then the foxes started to expand and, and move around more. And so uh, one thing that we've seen in the 20th century is that red foxes have moved from the east across what? And the, these lines are just showing red foxes got into Oklahoma here in the 1920s, and then over here in the 1930s, and so on. This is just showing the expansion, this westward movement of eastern red foxes. Who are these eastern red foxes? Um, this is, uh, if you go way back into some of the journals in the 1700s, they say there weren't very many red fox in the southeastern United States. And there are records of people bringing red fox from Europe over to this area, introducing them for hunting and so on in the 1700s. So the, big, the main hypothesis that's been going over the last many decades is that these eastern red foxes were European red foxes moving west. And so we have all these alien European red foxes coming into these new areas. But when we look at the genetics here, look at this. White is native. Most of these eastern red foxes are not European. They're native that came down from Canada over the last 20,000 years and uh, moved into this area from there. They might not have been very uh, common in the southeastern United States in the 1700s, but they were there, and they continued to move down over time. 
So one thing we know is that most of the red fox across the United States and North America are not European. We know that. Um, we don't know for sure, though, what's totally going on. Here's the, this uh, northeastern group that's probably moved down here and then started to spread this way. We have this group that's tied to Euro, Eurasia, and they've kind of expanded south, and some of those are getting into these populations in the west. And what, one of the challenges here is that some of these populations, the Sierra Nevada red fox and so on, they're actually very scarce now, and they're endangered species. So this is an important management question. We want to protect the genetics and so on of these uh, native red fox in these mountainous habitats, and we're finding that some of the genetics around them are from non-native, so how do we separate the two and keep them apart? That's a very challenging thing to deal with. Will they, will they breed with the, with the Arctic fox? Uh, I'm not sure if they breed with Arctic fox. They definitely, all these different red fox breed with each other. I'm not sure about their, I think they do form hybrids with the Arctic fox. But look at here, in the Southern Rockies, we have a question mark. We haven't really figured this out yet. And Ben Sachs and the other guys at University of California, Davis, Carrie Merson, who's a graduate student working at uh, Rocky Mountain Biological Lab in, uh, above Crested Butte, they're doing this and we're sending them some of these samples, these ear things, so they can figure out what's going on. Um, here is a beautiful book uh, written in 1910 by Warren, The Mammals of Colorado. And you go through it and you find this section, here it is on the Vulpes macrurus, the western red fox. You get to this section right here, and look what they see. It says that red foxes are rarely found below 8,000 feet. So this is an animal that was a high elevation animal, not found in these lower areas, as we were saying before. Earl rode his horse around, never saw a red fox until he got up in the hills, and then he'd see him. Um, so it was a this isolated population from the glaciation was a mountain specialist. So as we see it moving down, is this the native red fox moving down into these lower elevation habitats? Is this this eastern red fox moving across? Is it some other origin? Here's another possible origin. Look at this. Uh, it's talking about prices of fox furs. Here's a slide that'll show this more easy so we can read it. But red fox come in lots of different varieties. This is called the silver fox, right? Um, this is the cross fox. Here's the red version. These are what, back in 1910, you could sell a silver fox for $1,000. <laughs> and so what did that mean? Some people wanted to be able to, you know, couldn't find them that much in the wild, right? So you could create a fox farm. And you could raise foxes. And so the work that, we've originally done, or that University of California Davis has originally done, is showing that a lot of these samples we're sending them using mitochondrial DNA shows that the foxes are native and they're moving downhill, right? But now Carrie's work using nuclear DNA is showing that maybe they're not native and they haven't completely sorted those. So they're right in the middle of the science here. It's really exciting and fast. But one of the things she asked me for help on is, well, were there fox farms in this area, because that could be one of the sources of red fox that weren't native coming into this area. And so, so far I've found two places where there were pretty extensive fox farms right in Gunnison. And so when the fox farm is done, you know, they might open the cages and all the fox run out and start a new population. And that could have been starting in the 1950s or uh, early 1960s. Um, so, this is interesting. We have these red foxes in 1910. They're all over the Rockies, but at high elevations. Why aren't they down here? And it takes all the way until uh, the late part of the 20th century for the foxes to show up in the agricultural regions around Gunnison and these places up here in the, uh, in the uh, Carbondale area and so on. Um, one idea is that, well, their expansion as a mountain specialist, but probably not an evolutionarily non-adaptable species, red fox are very adaptable, uh, they could have been held back from these larger canids that uh, kill, hunt and kill red fox. And when you uh, removed the wolf out of the, uh, here you go, Sarah, with the controversy. So you remove the wolf <laughs> out of Colorado and it allows coyotes to do much better. 
And then with a lot of coyotes, there's a lot of pressure on red fox. So what was, may have been stopping the red fox from expanding down in elevation might have been the presence of coyotes. With killing a lot of coyotes, a lot of coyote control, and changes to the landscape, more human resources, there might just been enough um, resources available for those high mountain specialists to move down. But we don't know this, if, if they're the native ones or if they're fox farm ones or whatever. So it's still a question that's out there. The last thing is just that, you know, these red foxes, if you look in these old accounts, people would say this was the wildest of these animals in this part of the world, the wildest. They were very shy of people. They wouldn't get close. But today, that's not the kind of fox that we're seeing a lot, right? They're, we call it a synanthropic species, a species that likes humans and is associated with humans. Sometimes it's very positive. People love red foxes. I've heard a lot of comments tonight. People love red foxes. Um, but they also can cause problems, right? These kinds of problems. Here's some newspaper clippings that show um, my son loves chihuahuas, so I showed him this one and he got really mad at me. <laughs> uh, but they, they kill pets. They uh, might transmit disease. Sometimes they're attacking people and so on. So um, it matters, though, whether these are native red fox or non-native red fox, or it might matter. Maybe it doesn't matter, but uh, it's an interesting question. Um, one of the issues is that not only with humans, but if, if these are non-native foxes, alien foxes, and they're causing human problems, does that give us justification to go out and control these foxes and try to get them out of the landscape that they've moved into? Or if they're native foxes, would we have a different way of approaching that? Here's an animal that I spend a lot of time with and I love dearly. This is the Gunnison sage grouse. And we don't have any evidence that foxes are uh, preying on Gunnison sage grouse. They seem to not, foxes don't seem to like the sagebrush very much. They like more wooded areas. But there is a lot of people thinking that maybe foxes could potentially be a predator. If these are native red fox and they're eating this native endangered species, what do we do about it? If it's a non-native red fox that's eating this endangered species, it might be a clearer path of what, what we want to do. So anyway, it's an interesting question. Okay, anyway, that's, I'm, I think I took too much time, but these are some of the photographers that helped me out. Uh, these are some of my students that were really involved with Red Fox over the last 10 years, and some of my helpers uh, from the Division of Wildlife and uh, Ben, and uh, really wanted to uh, say that the Thornton Undergraduate Research Program has been a really amazing resource for our students at Western, great program, uh, and I just can't be happier that uh, we have that at Western, so. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. So we do have some time for some questions. And in order for this to be on grassroots, we need you to speak into this microphone, even though you can't hear yourself speak. So if you have a question, I'll bring the mic. Great presentation. Thank you very much. My name's Dick Philby. And hey, uh, hey. great to see you present tonight. <laughs> thank you. Um, my question was, you mentioned that red foxes may choose to starve for a period of time during the course of the winter, and arctic foxes can have a much longer starvation period. Can you give us some idea of the time period you're talking about, please? Yeah, thanks, Dick. Good to see you. <laughs> um, well, uh, my recollection, I don't know a lot about this, but the, the arctic fox has a better ability to starve than the red fox just because of its superior insulation and ability just to sit still for long periods of time and uh, not catabolizing any tissues. But they can go for several weeks, for sure, without eating. And uh, it's, a, it's a dangerous strategy because uh, by at some point you kind of reach a threshold where if you have to get up and then start trying to find food again, then you're probably much less yeah, able, weakened, and in a poor condition to be able to do that. And, and why would the food availability in the middle of winter change at that point? So it's a dangerous strategy uh, to take, but sometimes it makes sense if you're just spending hours and hours, miles and miles traveling around and there's just nothing to be found. Uh, you're wasting a lot of those resources and you probably last longer just sitting still. I was curious about the interaction between gray foxes and red foxes and how that affects the gray, uh, red fox distribution. 
Ah, good question. I don't know much about this at all. Um, the gray foxes and red foxes, as well as red foxes and arctic foxes, they do overlap significantly in their ranges. Um, but there are, there are also many places where you only find gray fox and you don't find red fox. Of course, many places where you only find arctic fox and you don't find. Uh, we think about with arctic fox that the distribution of arctic fox is limited by the distribution of red fox. But the distribution of red fox is probably limited not by arctic fox being there, but by food availability for them. So that is a, a kind of a known quantity. In terms of the gray fox and the red fox, I just really don't have, I would just be making something up. So I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't have any better answer. Hi, would you say something about their uh, circulation in their paws that prevents them from freezing? Right, yeah, the question's about how, this is another adaptation for winter that uh, many mammals and birds use, but it's a ability to, it's called heterothermy. So remember we talked about the mammals being homeothermic. So they maintain their body temperature um, uh, across all time periods, but they also have adaptive heterothermy, which means that, and, and it's called regional heterothermy, where certain parts of the body are at different temperatures than other parts of the body. And when you have these extremities like ears and tails and paws and things, uh, that's, there's more surface area relative to the volume. You're not really generating heat from those areas. So they're major areas where you lose heat. And so there's a couple things that happen that red foxes can do is they can, first of all, um, uh, constrict their blood vessels. And so it reduces the blood flow out to those extremities. And then when you look at the temperature, you go from the core of the body at, let's say, 98 degrees, and then it goes down to about uh, 90 degrees or something as you're you know, down here in the shoulder region, and then it goes down, I'm not sure how low red foxes get it, but it can be much closer to the environmental temperature, you know, still above freezing temperature, right? But much, much lower, so then that, that gradient of heat loss is uh, much less, and you're not losing that much uh, heat out of those extremities. And then the second part of that is called a countercurrent heat exchange. And so what's happening is the cold blood from the veins that's coming back rubs against the warm blood from the arteries going down. And so you have this passive movement of heat. So you're warming the cold blood. So when it goes back, it doesn't need to be warmed up as much as more efficient. And you're cooling the hot blood so you're not losing that heat as it goes way out to the extremities. So it's a way of sort of intercepting the heat before it gets all the way out. So yeah, they're able to do that very effectively. We have a, a black fox that visits our house on a nightly basis. Is that a very, is that a rare species of, of fox? Yeah, so the question is about black foxes. And a black fox, the other name for black fox is a silver fox. Um, it is, it's just the red fox, but it's a different color phase. And they are much rarer, uh, but when you look across the whole United States, you hardly find any silver foxes, black foxes in the eastern United States. They're much more common in the west and in these native mountain populations of the Rockies and the Sierra Nevadas. Um, but they, they aren't super rare, but they are rarer than uh, the red uh, color phase. And they also, uh, as we were talking about before, in terms of fur trading, they're much more valued. Um, but you, they seem to be really the ones that are up at the highest elevation. Uh, if anyone's ever been on top of Uncompagre Peak, there seems to be this permanent <laughs> silver fox that lives up there. Almost everyone who climbs this peak sees the silver fox up on top of Uncompagre. So there's places where they're, they seem to be more common up at higher elevations, even up in the uh, Alpines. Anybody would like to stick around and ask Pat any other questions, I know he'll be happy to stick around a little bit. Thanks for coming, sure. and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.